Here's uh, Clarence. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Clarence. Thanks for thanks for staying uh, for this talk. So uh, I just want to get a quick poll of the audience. How many of you have used machine learning before? Have have played with it? Like taken classes or something? Oh yeah, that's a good number. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, how to bypass machine learning systems. Uh, machine learning has been has been in the in in the news and in everywhere in tech over the last two to five years. Um, I did a quick uh, crawl of RSA and Black Hat the expo floor. You know how companies always have to publish some snippets about what they do. Um, and I was just looking for how many companies claimed they were doing something in the area of machine learning or deep learning or data analytics uh, to solve security problems. So this is just a particular instance of a company that claims to do like deep learning for, uh, for malware detection and APT attacks. I thought it was interesting. So over the years, uh, you can see the, the number of instances that uh, companies have claimed to do machine learning in security. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, from 2012 to 2015, there was pretty much a, um, a, a, a 6x increase. And um, 2016, is, it's a bit lower, maybe because people realize that it's, uh, it's not that easy. So um, this is a, a, a neural network. I, I won't spend too much time going into detail about what a neural network does or how it works exactly. Um, you can find that online yourself. But basically, the idea is that you have a, um, a standard infrastructure consisting of uh, input units and uh, hidden layers and, and output layers and activation functions, which are each one of the small circles there. And each one of these uh, units is connected to each other by, by a weight. Um, and so when you want to find the output of a, a neural net, all you have to do is to um, check which uh, activation functions are actually uh, activated and, and in use, and then you would result, uh, the, the, the result would be um, this output vector called logits, and then you would basically feed it through a softmax function to get the prediction. And so neural nets are all about um, distributing blame. So during the training of the model, when you feed in data, um, when you get a wrong prediction during the training phase, you would basically go through the model in the process of backpropagation to assign blame to see which units were, uh, were responsible for making this wrong decision. And so when you find the units that make the wrong decision, then you would basically reduce uh, the amount of decision-making power that they have by decreasing their weights and biases by the, by the appropriate amount to how much they contributed to this wrong decision. And of course, you can do this uh, efficiently with optimization algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent, which you may have heard of in other machine learning algorithms as well. So my, the main focus of my, of my presentation will be how to bypass this. Um, if there are any questions about how this works at all, I'll be going into further detail. This is not just about bypassing deep learning system. It's also about bypassing just any general machine learning algorithm, uh, which I will go into detail later. Uh, I have a quick demo here on uh, how to bypass an, an image classification engine, which is one of the most classic um, deep learning problems. The, the thing is that there's this data set called the CIFAR10, um, and what this is is just uh, 60,000 images that are very small, uh, 32 by 32 pixels, and they each belong to one of 10 classes. So I chose randomly two classes here, a dog and an automobile or a car. So what I have here is basically two kinds of, of images, the, the normal and the adversarial. And so I'd pre-train a model that would well recognize this properly. So if I if I try to evaluate what this what, what this uh, image is, it is it's a dog, and you can see from the from the image on the right that it is a dog. But if you see here Dog at 10 also looks like a dog. It's a little bit more noisy, but you know it still looks like a dog to, to you and me. If we actually run this through the same uh, evaluation algorithm, 
It says it's a ship. So that's weird, right? And so this is just a standard pre-trained model that you can download from TensorFlow. And you, you can see that you can generate images that trick these models that are trained using Google's own engines. Uh, they, they have been trained using GPUs for thousands and thousands of hours, things that I would not be able to afford on my own AWS account. Similarly for the automobile, just to show you again, it's a car. I run the, the normal image, it says it's an automobile. And I run the other one, it says it's a, um, let's see. Okay, so you see it, 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 looks, it looks slightly different, but it says it's a cat. So that's just some small example. We'll dive into each of these images and see exactly what is different, exactly how we're generating this later. Let's open up a Python console and uh, let's look into how these images are different from each other. So I'm just importing the standard libraries. I'm gonna read in the normal dog image. It's just gonna be a 32 by 32 uh, by three vector because there's RGB values. So you can see it's nothing, nothing unexpected. Um, you see the shape is 32 by 32 by three. And um, the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is 255 as expected. So the values for RGMB range from 0 to 255. Okay. So what we're going to do now is to read in the uh, adversarial image. So I want to read in the adversarial image. And uh, okay, so this is what the adversarial image looked like. We're going to take the diff of these two and see how different they are. Same shape. So the diff is just minus one to two pixels difference. And, and yet we can make the model make uh, a wrong prediction or a wrong classification. So let's save this diff and let's see what the, what the diff actually looks like. Okay. And the diff actually shows up here, so we can see it. It's just rubbish. It's a rubbish vector that we can add to a, an image to, to make the model make a wrong decision. Yep. So same thing for um, the other one. Doc F10 is uh, is another example of an adversarial image that uh, is generated in the in the same uh, in the same method. And w the difference between Doc F1 and Doc F10 is just how big the perturbation is. So how how many pixels it differs from the original image. And the reason why we want to change the the amount of perturbation uh, between the original image and the adversarial image is because when you alter an image by one pixel for each uh, color value, then uh, it's not that easy to be detected by, uh, by, by a human. But if you, if you change it by, like say, 10 pixels, then it, it, it's more possible that the human will be able to tell that something weird is going on with it. But the reason why you would change uh, you, you would change an image by a larger amount is because it's more likely for you to trick a, a machine learning model that um, something is actually different. So you, as you can see, the, the diff is, is much larger now, and we'll go on. So I'll, I'll go ahead and explain uh, how these attack works and and why they work. But first of all, uh, let's look at the kinds of attack that you can have on on machine learning models. In general, there are uh, three kinds of attacks. You can have causative attacks and exploratory attacks. Causative attacks just means that 
you have access to the training, the training stage. So in training a machine learning model, what you usually have uh, in, a, in a supervised case is you have a bunch of input data and you want to train the model to do something that, is, uh, that you do not explicitly program rules for. Um, and this could be the example of if you have 60,000 images of uh, 10 classes, as, as you see, as, as you see before, then you have, uh, s you have uh, 600 images of each class and you would basically train the model to recognize um, each one of these models um, and recognize their characteristics, the, uh, the kinds of pixels that make up a dog and the kinds of pixels that make up a shit. And then you would basically go on and go on to the training phase after the model is trained. Uh, after, after the model is trained, you go on to the testing phase and then you would feed it unseen data and see if it actually generalizes well and makes the right decisions. The exploratory phase is, uh, the exploratory attacks are more interesting because you don't actually have to have access to um, the training phase. So this is uh, applicable in most instances. Let's say you have a, um, an online Google Translate service that famously uses machine learning models to uh, to learn from to learn from its past mistakes and to make better predictions as time goes on. You do not you don't actually have access to the training phase because most of the time when machine learning models are deployed in the wild, they are they, they don't take in uh, general and public input uh, in in immediate training. Uh, most of the time, you just get the results and then the training is done separately. Uh, after the data is cleaned. So you can still attack models like that by just crafting input samples that are more likely to trick these models. Um, and then of course you also have the other kind of attack which is analogous to, to just DDoS attacks. Basically you're trying to decrease the reliability of these classifiers and to make them more unreliable. You want to make everything, for example, be classified as a ship no matter what it looks like. So why can we do this? Um, the reason that you can trick machine learning models is because they don't learn like how, that, like how humans learn. Uh, and this might be surprising to, to, to many people, even those working in the field, even those who are very familiar with machine learning. Uh, when you see that a classifier successfully predicts, um, successfully classifies images with a 99% accuracy, then you kind of think that uh, these classifiers are recognizing ships and dogs and cats in the same ways that humans do. Um, but they actually don't. So what uh, classifiers and deep learning models do is they just look for characteristics in the pixels that happen to be common among uh, uh, among images of the same class. And humans don't think like that. For example, when we look at a dog, even if the the color of the dog were different, uh, e e even if uh, there were a large pixel differences from all examples of dogs that we have, we have seen before in the past, uh, we're still able to generalize well and look for certain characteristics of the image that are more high level that we're able to draw generalizations from and conclude that that is still a dog. So this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, an important thing that we should take note of. Um, no matter what we're designing classifiers for, we should make sure that the true positives are real positives and there can be false positives in any predictions that these machine learning models make. So basically the intuitions for how you generate um, examples for adversarial deep learning are uh, you run an input model, you, you run an, an input sample through the classifier model. If you don't have access to the classifier model, let's say you were trying to do it for a, an online mal malware classifier that you don't know what model they're using, you don't know what data they use to train the model, then you just have to do, use a substitute model, which I will go into later. The second step is to, base on the model prediction, derive a perturbation tensor, a vector or a matrix that m maximizes the chances of misclassification. So I'll go into more detail about how to do this later. And the third step is to scale this perturbation tensor by some arbitrary magnitude. The larger magnitude you scale this by, the more chance you have of tricking the machine learning model. The smaller uh, magnitude you, 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 you tune this by, the smaller chance you have of tricking the machine learning model, but also the smaller chance that a human looking at this input will realize that something wrong is going on. So the most simple way that we can generate um, these adversarial images is to basically traverse the manifold and find blind spots in input. And what this means is just, uh, let's say you have a 32 by 32 um, pixel matrix and you're trying to look for uh, 
misclassifications of uh, a, dog, a dog image. So what you can do is to just brute force, to change each, each pixel one by one, uh, increment each value um, from, from, from 0 to 255, and just make small, small perturbations in the input to find out um, which image of a dog would uh, would be misclassified by this model, and this is this is okay. The, the, you, people used to do this in the past, um, but it would take a long, long time, especially if you're looking at larger images. If you're looking at malware classification, for example, then typically you have to change millions and millions of bytes, and it's just a combinatorial explosion. So to optimize this search, uh, you can take the input of the target with respect to that target output class, which is what inspired the the, the next the next method. Uh, which is linear adversarial perturbation. So if you can think of a, of a neural network as basically uh, a black box when you have inputs and, and output, uh, and basically what you're trying to do is to um, feed in inputs that would result in a different output from the previous input of the same class, and then you would take the cross, the cross entropy uh, of the input sample and the predicted class, and this uh, can be done without the, the actual model as well, but uh, you have to uh, create a, a substitute model in order to get access to the, to the inside parameters. It's easily found by, by backpropagation, and um, I have some sample code, code on this on, on a repo that, that I publish online, and you can play with it yourself to find out how it works and, and, and to see if you can generate adversarial samples for arbitrary uh, machine learning classifiers yourself. The last method is, is a little bit more complicated, and the motivation behind this method is simply to reduce the amount of perturbation that you have to add to a, to a valid input in order to trick the machine learning model. Um, the basic idea is that you, you want to try to find uh, points in this, in this input vector that would allow you to make small changes to the, to, to the input, but then result in a larger change to the, to the output. So uh, this is an example saliency map, which is what we call um, the, a measure of how much each pixel actually affects the output result. As you can see in the, in the center of, of the image, um, you actually have the largest saliency, which means that if you change a pixel, uh, if you change the pixel in the center of the image by a value of one, it's going to affect the output with a higher probability than if you change a pixel by the value of one on the very edge of the image. Which kind of makes sense because if you if you think about the edges, most of the time they contain backgrounds. Most of the time, it's not important things that would result in a difference in the classification. So we'll go on to the threat model. Um, basically, this is the different kind of things that you have to do given the different kinds of knowledge that you have in each attack scenario. Um, the, the, the most easy way to, to attack something is if you have the model hyperparameters, if you're training a neural network, for example, if you know the kinds of tools that we use to train it, the, the frameworks that we use to train it, uh, each value of the weights in this neural network and the activation function values, the biases, for example. Um, and then if you have slightly less information, you only have access to the architecture, you, you for example, know that this is trained with a neural network. It's a three-layer neural net, for example. And then slightly less uh, data, you have only access to the training data. And even slightly less uh, examples, you have it's basically a, a black box. So all you have is the ability to input stuff into this classifier, and then you can see the outputs. And we can see that in this case, you can still generate um, you can still generate adversarial examples to, to trick these models. So this is just a study of what people have done um, in, in in this area. In general, the efforts in adversarial machine learning have been have been pretty have been pretty scattered. Um, there's there's not a lot of a lot of new developments, um, which is why I started. Um, talking about this thing because I feel like um, the security industry needs to look at machine learning models um, since a lot of the critical infrastructure will be shifting to machine learning in the future. For example, self-driving cars, medical devices, um, and image recognition, speech translation, all of these are powered by machine learning and sooner, sooner, uh, sooner or later we'll be relying on these more than we'd like to. And the thing is that a lot of these are not uh, very reliable. If, 
if uh, someone were to go in and try to tamper with such a system, you can find that they can easily be tampered. Some medical imaging devices that try to find, for example, if uh, a cell in a patient is benign or, is benign or not by looking at the, the, the X-ray output um, can be easily fooled um, by, by, by something like that. And we can see that there can be dire consequences. There have been examples online and papers published on how deep learning engines used by self-driving cars can be fooled by um, images that are just held up by a person with a green light even though um, there is a red light in real life, but the, the, the model just sees the green light or sees a red light with a slight perturbation and thinks that it's not a red light and then it just proceeds. So you can see how this will result in, in human uh, loss of life or our other dire consequences. And this is why I think that the security industry needs to start to audit these, these statistical methods, need to start looking at how reliable and how tamper-proof these uh, machine learning models are. So what can you do with limited knowledge? In most real-world systems, we don't actually have access to the model parameters. We don't have access to how the model was actually trained or what input was actually used to, to this. So a lot of the time, you can make good guesses. And this is kind of a black art. But as you come, as you come into contact with more and more systems that are using machine learning, uh, you, can, you can make some, some good guesses. For example, image classifications, uh, the state of the art would be convolutional neural nets. And uh, if you can guess that an image classification is done by a convolutional neural net, then you will be able to uh, generate adversarial examples that are more accurate. Speech recognition, they are done using LSTM and recursive neural networks. Um, a lot of the time, anything that has, that has to do with, with temporal inputs uh, are trained using long short-term memory networks and, and, and recursive neural networks. Um, if you're looking at more general purpose machine learning frameworks like Amazon machine learning or any kind of machine learning as a service, um, then a lot of the time, because they have to generalize well, you're looking at very shallow networks. Since having a deeper network will result in a more probable overfitting. Uh, so that's if you can guess. But what if you can't guess or you're not very sure of the guess? You can still you can still pwn it. So I have a, I have a second demo here to show. Um, Captures are, are one of the most interesting ways that um, are, are, are most commonly used to, to differentiate a human from a bot, right? So most websites you go to, if you want to tell that uh, it's, a, it's a real human there, you would put a capture there. And obviously, there have been many services on, online, like Death by Capture, that you can pay for, maybe a few cents for, for a thousand captures solved to help with your automation. Um, but this is not very scalable because, like, how many people are willing to sit down at a computer solving captures all day for for one dollar a day? Um, so it's not, not very practical, and it's it's a it's a matching problem. So <coughs> excuse me. So there have been solutions out there that use deep learning to solve these these things. And so this is an, an open source example. Um, it's called Capture Crusher. It's pretty good. Um, I didn't write this. This is this is just something online and. Uh, this is just a tool that I'm using to generate captures, pretty pretty generic captures. They're not the most complicated captures, but uh, as, as you can see, um, the complication, the, the, the complexity of the, of the captures doesn't actually matter. This is what the model actually looks like. Um, and so I won't go into, in, into detail at cleaning the model, but what this is basically doing is to um, predict the Actual uh, is is to show the actual labels for for this input and then, and then show the prediction. <coughs> and we're going to show that um, this actually does solve captures with a certain degree of accuracy. Um, in most real cases, especially since you don't have access to how the captures that you're seeing online are actually generated, um, you can't train a perfect model for for solving something like that. Uh, so. There'll be, a, there'll be a high accuracy, but, but there'll be still things that you get wrong depending on what the captures look like. Let's generate some captures here. We generated 10. Um, you can see they look like pretty generic captures. I think they're pretty complicated, and I might get some of these wrong if I were looking at these and try to type them out. Yeah, just generated more. <coughs> so I'm deleting them, and I'm going to show that you can actually generate captures that trick this model that solves captures using deep learning. So it's kind of it's it's kind of a meta because what we're doing is there's a deep learning model trained to solve these captures, and we want to generate captures that can trick this deep learning model so it doesn't successfully solve captures. 
So this was the training of the model. You can see training deep learning models are, are kind of, uh, they take a long time, especially if you're looking at uh, a little bit larger images. I started um, on July 12th at 5.53 a.m. And um, by the time the model finished, it was July 13th, 9 a.m. So it took, took a long time. I did this online on Amazon GPU cluster, so this cost about $120. So it better work well. Um, and let's try it out. And we're evaluating this model for the, from these 10 captures that, that, we're, that we just generated. Just to see that it, it, made, it made the right decisions. Okay. I'm just gonna wait for it to, to solve. It's, it's taking some time. This is already pretty fast. I guess it's, it is faster than using like death by capture or online services with a human behind the computer. Okay, so it predicted all of them correctly. This is, this is lucky, like, if you, if you generate more, more images, uh, sometimes there'll be like 0.9 accuracy. So let's, let's look at one of them. Let's look at the, the first one. So the first one you see IACTGB. Um, and the prediction is, is right. And so let's look at this actual image. It is IAC TGB, yeah? <coughs> so what we're gonna do now is to generate the adversarial version of these examples. So they're gonna look similar to the original image that, the, that this uh, framework can solve very well, um, but a, a human is still gonna be able to read them correctly, but the deep learning model is not. So we're gonna generate these images. These are just the same 10 captures. And what we're doing is we're running it through a substitute deep learning uh, model that I wrote that is different from the original capture framework that is used to solve these, these things. So this is a substitute model, it's an example of a black box. So what this does is just five lines of code that generates this, that's, uh, that, that's in the code base that I'll be releasing online, that I've released online. And so you see, this is the normal example, and this is the adversarial example. They look alike, it's slightly different, if you, if you look at the, the, the difference. The first one you can't really tell at all, which means that the, the pixel differences are actually in a white space, and the human eye is pretty bad at, at uh, differentiating white and slightly off-white, so that's probably why. And so if you do an evaluation of the adversarial examples, you see that it doesn't perform nearly as well as with the original examples. And let's just run these. Gonna take a couple minutes. Not a couple minutes, a couple seconds. And so it's gonna give me a score at the end. And it's gonna show me at each position in this capture, there are, there, are six, there are six digits in each capture, how many it got right. So let's see, at position one, it only got one out of the 10 right. Position two only got two out of the 10 right. At position um, three, it actually got seven out of the 10 right. So, but the thing is that with captures, as long as you get one out of the 10, uh, one, out, one out of six digits uh, wrong, then you, you'd be blocked. So, we can see that these actually look the same to a human, we'd be able to solve them, but it successfully tricks the, the deep learning model. So, earlier in, earlier in the presentation, I mentioned something about transferability. I, basically, these attacks are not only applicable to deep learning models, they're applicable to all kinds of machine learning models. Um, these are some examples of machine learning models that have been studied. Uh, for example, li linear classifiers, um, spectral clustering algorithms, support vector machines, decision trees. The thing is that, and this is still an open research problem as to why this happens, but adversarial samples that are generated using deep learning have a pretty good chance of fooling a previously unseen model, even if it's a totally different model trained using totally different things and in a totally different infrastructure. You can see that this is a, a matrix of um, 
adversarial samples are generated using one technique and tested on a different machine learning technique. So on the y-axis, you have the, um, the, ad the adversarial generation method, and on the x-axis, you have the technique that is used to test these adversarial samples. You can see that uh, LR stands for linear regression, and SVM stands for support vector machines. If you train a adversarial sample on a logistic regressor, and you test it on a support vector machine, which is totally different in, in, in terms of infrastructure and, and the math behind it even, then you see that it has successfully tricks the model with a 91% accuracy, which is pretty good. And deep neural networks are just a, an, an easy way of training models, since you don't have to meddle with too many model parameters and stuff. And Substitute models are, are another thing that we can use to, to train um, adversarial samples on a black box model that we have never seen before. Basically, you want to treat uh, the new model's uh, input um, with the output uh, labels of the, of the previous model. And you are training a new model based on the, a model that you don't have access to, which, uh, which is why it's called a substitute model. And why is this, why is this possible? So, Transferability, as I mentioned before, is still an open research problem. Um, the, the fact that you can trick machine learning models is because there are many blind spots in the data. When, when you train a classifier to learn something, it is not learning everything about a dog, or it, 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 it cannot possibly classify every single image that exists um, of a dog as a dog correctly, because there are certain blind spots that, that this model learns. So there's this model versus reality dim dimensionality mismatch. And people start to question, is this model actually not learning anything meaningful at all? So what this means is that when you, whenever you deploy machine learning models, you should use with caution, um, in, especially in critical deployments where there's, uh, where there's human life at stake or uh, when there's large fi financial loss at stake. Uh, you shouldn't make false assumptions about what the model learns, and you should always evaluate how resilient a model is in, in adversarial um, in, in, in the face of adversarial attacks, and you should spend efforts to make models more robust. So how? The most straightforward one is to basically generate adversarial samples for machine learning models, and then train your model using these adversarial samples. Basically, you're trying to iron out um, any kind of imperfect knowledge. There are other techniques that can be used, like distillation, which means you train the model two times, first feeding the first uh, feeding the original images into into the first model, and then you train the second model with a with the output of the first model, and this helps to distill the amount of information that is stored inside a neural network. Um, this was initially used to reduce model sizes so they can fit on your mobile phone, for example, um, because. If you train it on a large GPU cluster, there, there, there will be many, many dead unit, many, many dead units that are not actually used in the in the actual prediction. And you can also use other methods like using loss function and and, and regularization techniques. So, deep honing is a is a um, is is something that I that I released at DevCon this year, and basically. It aims to be the metasploit of machine learning. So what it has is basically some some structured code on how you can generate machine learning uh, some generate adversarial samples on machine learning models um, and basically you can input your own machine learning models the, with with their own infrastructure and then use standard techniques for generating adversarial samples that these that this uh, framework provides and um, it's pretty well documented, I think. Um, there are some links to the data sets and, and papers that are used, and also other sources of, of code that, that you can use. So please check it out. Um, just play around with it, and, and if you want to help contribute to it, that'll be, that'll be great. So I think that penetration testing of statistical models and machine learning systems is, is important because, um, as I mentioned before, more and more of the time we're relying on these systems and we, a lot of people don't have a good understanding of how these things work. So um, having a good understanding is what's required to really evaluate how resilient these models are to adversarial input. And you should train these models with adversarial samples for increased robustness. So please play with it and contribute. Um, there's this uh, last interesting note that I think is an interesting research area. Um, deep learning and privacy is, uh, is, is, is an interesting area that has been up and coming in the past few years. Basically, um, there have been research that's, that's done that 
uh, shows that you can reconstitute training samples from a trained black box model. So if you can think about a facial recognition engine um, that, that recognizes your, your face and, and my face, uh, and these models are stored on in, in, a, in a mobile phone, for example. Um, researchers have shown that you can regenerate um, the faces that are used to train this model um, pretty, pretty uh, easily, uh, just by access to just with access to these models, which are distributed to to everyone's devices. So, can we precisely control the learning ob objective of, of these models? Can we train the model without having complete access to training data? These are interesting research questions that I think have to be solved before we can actually rely heavily on, on machine learning in, in, in everyday systems. So, this is important because more critical systems rely on it, and we need people with both statistical and security skill sets to develop robust systems and evaluate these infrastructures. So, in other words, I think you should learn it in the next five years, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be very important, and that's all I have. Thank you. Hi, so uh, any questions there? There. Yeah. So the question is, are there any effective countermeasures uh, that I have found to be effective during the development of machine learning systems? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, the adversarial uh, attack vector is only one very particular um, attack vector against, ma against machine learning. There, there are other uh, like system level vulnerabilities in, in many machine learning frameworks that affect uh, how accurate the training is done. Previously, uh, I did research in principal component analysis, poisoning, which is basically a poisoning during the, d during the training phase. So principal component analysis is a technique that's used to select uh, dimensions. It's, it's used for dimensionality reduction. So um, you run your, your input through uh, this algorithm and it will tell you which dimensions can help you make a better classification. And these, these can be poisoned very easily as well. I think that the point behind this is the same as any other kind of, kind of system. You have to do some kind of penetration testing because different systems have different objectives and the attack vectors for each of these systems are different. In some models, it's applicable that um, adversarial samples uh, should, be, should be protected against. Um, for example, if you look at the Gmail uh, malware classifier, which classifies PDF documents for, for, uh, for, for malware, um, there have been researchers that, sh that showed that they can generate malware samples that would actually bypass this, and th the prize is that they actually get their samples onto someone else's machine, and it uh, gets past Gmail's malware classifier, which is, which is done using a, a, a deep learning model. So the way that you make these better is to basically generate adversarial samples and to train your model with these adversarial samples and basically it's like telling a child that you made this, you made this mistake in the past but then um, I'm going to teach you that this actually is a ship, this is actually a dog and you shouldn't make the wrong, uh, you shouldn't make the, 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 the wrong decision again in the future. So that, that's just one of the ways that, that can be used and, and there are many other. Okay, any more questions? Cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.